the reduction of cost associated with mass production led this into a whole range of new markets. That included security, medical work, and of course also a very widespread use in uh, condition monitoring. I did mention uh, oil analysis uh, earlier, but also the use of computers enabled far more information to be acquired and to be managed from the different uh, technical areas of oil analysis. And that, that includes uh, measurement of uh, iron particles, ferrography, um, looking at counting and sizing of the distribution of particles, um, examining more closely the nature of uh, the shape and features within particles, which enables much better diagnosis and also spectrometry, which allows for the, uh, the constitution of particles to give some kind of uh, indication of where they come from. And these different techniques have led to a very rich um, observation of the type of evidence which is, is floating in the oil as a result from wear debris. Probably the, uh, the dominant area of research in the 90s was the nature of computational methods. And these really arose from uh, the availability of uh, a lot more computing power, but also the desire to automate a great deal more of uh, the chores of both maintenance management and the technical tasks associated with condition monitoring. So we see a, a great deal of um, optimization techniques, trying to identify what's best in a process and uh, making the most rapid treatments. We also see uh, particular applications for classification, that's identifying what type of result we have in data, and pattern recognition, which has been used for the fault detection, but also the severity of uh, the, the faults which have been detected. And there was a great deal of research expended in the area of neural networks and uh, other algorithms which uh, have a, a purely numerical approach to the nature of the, uh, of the task. It's also a decade of rapid progress in the area of uh, portable and handheld devices. And uh, it may surprise you that uh, some of the earliest uh, personal digital assistance, PDAs, were adapted for use uh, in the maintenance business to replace uh, paper-based processes on uh, the, um, the clipboard. And one of the um, initial uh, problems of those was toughness. Uh, they, they got dropped in water. Uh, they needed to be operated with gloved hands. And uh, in particular, the interfacing of some other devices, um, so that, uh, for example, connecting uh, vibration sensors or thermal sensors has always been a challenge for some of these simple devices. It's also al always been a problem in terms of obsolescence, because such, such devices, while they're cheap and programmable, tend not to last very long in the marketplace. But they've always had great potential, and uh, hence a lot of research has been done. There's also been a great deal of new thinking in the area, for example, of service as a process uh, rather than, uh, as I observed earlier, the uh, manufacture, then the sale of spare parts as part of the maintenance process. And uh, it, it took Rolls-Royce at least 15 years to get there in terms of its uh, total care package. So initial processes of, uh, of research and planning and, and strategy were made in the 90s. There, there were a whole range of uh, standards. Uh, so, for example, there's the, the 93 standard on, on the glossary of terms. And there was also new partnership work. Uh, Mimosa, which leads to a whole range of uh, systems interchange standards, uh, started in 1994 in the States and was launched in Europe in 1998. Uh, in so I'm going to move on to uh, state-of-the-art and to think about uh, what we can offer today that perhaps um, integrates uh, some of the things that we've seen in the past. What we can offer today is a contribution uh, from cradle to grave, or perhaps I should say cradle to cradle, because we are interested in not only uh, life extension and uh, end of life, but also recycling. We're interested in this uh, nature of integrating systems and service, and we recognize that the term maintenance is just part of the whole. And in particular, the term through life has started to identify this uh, image of maintenance being part of the design process right through to the disposal process. 
the uh, contributions we see in areas of competitiveness and uh, we can be fairly confident that uh, people the world over are using similar technologies and equipment to us, similar software to us. So actually the maintenance and through life processes are part of our competitiveness worldwide. We're also seeing a new contribution in the areas of environment and sustainability. And maintenance engineers might tell you that they've been doing this forever. They've been extending the life of equipment and trying to make it run efficiently with the uh, minimum of uh, impact on its environment for a long time. However, we do have a new emphasis on sustainability today. One of the key problems which arises today is that we can measure and record almost everything. And one of our challenges is turning the uh, plethora of data into real information. Here at Cranfield, uh, in case you don't already know, uh, we have two major activities going on. We have the new uh, National EPSRC Centre for Innovative Manufacturing and Through Life Engineering Services, led by Professor Raj Kumar Roy. Uh, that, uh, is uh, working in collaboration with uh, our core partners, BAE Systems, Bombardier Transportation, Ministry of Defence and Rolls-Royce. And of course, uh, most of you will be aware that uh, Professor Ian Jennings leads our Integrated Vehicle Health Management Centre with Boeing. What are the kind of current and future themes that uh, these centres and colleagues around them might be wor working on? Well, it could be in areas of novel technologies, we could look at areas of life extension and we could also think about what's coming next in terms of the future. One of the technologies that's generating a great deal of interest from industrial clients in uh, civil and in defence is the use of wireless technology. This uh, is uh, not a technology in the future. Many parts of it are available right now. But as we work on such devices, we see them change from matchbox size to coin size. Th these are commercially available um, wireless platforms. Those type of platforms will hook together as uh, mesh type networks, which enable us, us to have uh, free and um, flexible networks to uh, join such sensors together. And they give us the ability to build sensor networks, which are uh, multi-sensor. They can have several sensors on one node, and they can have uh, wide areas, uh, multi-node sensors, which enable us to spread the effectiveness of such uh, sensing networks. Using commercial off-the-shelf off COTS uh, systems, we're able to uh, develop very rapidly and, of course, to um, undertake uh, quite low-cost developments. But there's probably two areas that uh, remain really important for this. Uh, power supplies is one of them, because really no point in having a wireless sensor that then needs a wire for a power supply. So uh, the ability to harvest the energy from the environment uh, is seeing a great deal of research at the moment. And uh, the other area, of course, is the um, uh, transducer and its interface with this type of device. Uh, the device wasn't uh, necessarily designed, as I mentioned, with the uh, other portable instrumentation uh, to talk to this uh, type of um, sensing platform, so there's a good deal of work going on in that area as well. Microelectronic mechanical systems, or MEMS, are making a really interesting impact in some of the sensing. These devices are already present around you. Uh, those of you who have a uh, telephone device that uh, is able to record um, any uh, vibration or voice or um, uh, wh which uh, direction you are holding it already have MEMS sensors in them. Uh, your um, car airbag also has a uh, MEMS sensor in it, <coughs> detecting vibration, and it's reduced the cost of the piezoelectric device um, down to about five bucks. So the cost of such uh, a sensor is more or less a throwaway price now. The, uh, the size of such a sensor is also smaller, so embedding it onto surfaces is uh, an entirely uh, sensible thing to do, and uh, it's, a th it's a throwaway item now. MEMS is also good for actuation. 
and uh, you've seen some micro machines which uh, seem to suggest that a, a motor and a gearbox are going to be the way forward. But one of the things that uh, micro actua actuators are good at is linear actuation. And uh, that gives us all new kinds of uh, opportunities for actuation at a small scale. So one thing that we'd be, we can be certain about is that small-scale devices are going to get to new places where we haven't been able to get to before, and uh, we also may be able to get into really tight spaces and to be able to repair other small systems. And that's going to lead to some interesting crossover between machines and medical applications as well. Going even smaller, nanotechnology is uh, offering some very interesting opportunities uh, both in uh, diagnostics but also in the area of uh, dry lubrication uh, applications. Uh, for example, the uh, Buckminster Fullerene molecule uh, can be loaded up in several layers called nano onions to form a really excellent graphite lubricant that works completely in the dry. Now, on Earth, that's not such a big problem. However, if we were to go into uh, areas where there's practically a, v a vacuum, then that starts to become much more important. And we can also consider that uh, for both industrial applications and for medical applications, the ability to deploy a large-scale um, uh, uh, quantity <coughs> of very small-scale components is going to be very important. So, for example, the middle image there is of polyethylene beads, which are now produced in industrial quantities. And uh, the nature of the structures of, of those uh, beads and the way in which they can be dispersed and coagulated are going to be very interesting for looking for faults of some of our lubricated systems. We also have the opportunity to deploy things into really tight spaces like some of the surfaces we're interested in, for example, in our bearings and gears. And they're also likely to produce very strong structures on a small scale. So carbon nanotubes, for example, uh, for their size, are immensely strong. And we've only just started to uh, investigate the way in which those will help us in the future. There's a whole range of mathematical applications that we've only just started to scratch the surface of at the moment. The image at the top is the real result from a well-known helicopter condition indicator during the failure of a gear on a real helicopter mechanism. And one of the complex bits of this bit of, bit of data <coughs> is that it's not a monotonic indicator. It goes up a bit and then it goes down a bit. And that confuses most algorithms and most human operators. Human operators are comfortable with the idea of a simple uh, traffic light indicator or perhaps a, a meter. So if, you, if your um, meter told you that uh, your uh, fuel gauge on your car looked like this on the way home, um, if it's in the red, you uh, perhaps start to become alarmed and uh, look for a, a filling station. If your petrol gauge wasn't working properly and oscillated a lot, you would start to distrust it. And that is one of the problems with many of our uh, condition monitoring problems, that uh, we would like to get much clearer indications of the failure because we need to be able to trust our measurement of the degradation. So that's all about the uh, nature of turning diagnostics, what's happened, into prognostics, what's happening in the future. And uh, it seems clear that uh, there's going to be some great cross-disciplinary applications here where the use of uh, telecare, for example, in uh, help for the uh, elderly, is uh, going to benefit from many of the technologies uh, in terms of uh, remote um, communications and uh, the sensing of uh, people's uh, healthy signs. One of the areas that's uh, going to keep us in work for the next few years is the F-35B, the, uh, the lightning uh, uh, joint strike fighter. Uh, this is the uh, short takeoff vertical landing version, uh, which uh, has a lift fan right through the middle of the fu fuselage. It has uh, lift both at the uh, front and the back of the, uh, of the aircraft. And uh, its mechanism looks uh, approximately like this. Uh, this was shown at the 2008 uh, Paris Air Show. Um, the front of the gas turbine drives a shaft through a coupling into a, uh, a vertical lift fan, which has two contra-rotating fans uh, just a few feet behind the pilot's head. Uh, it uses uh, 
uh, twin uh, bevel gearboxes uh, in there and it needs to come up to speed in uh, two or three seconds. At uh, the back end of that system is uh, this mechanism which is the jet pipe with uh, a uh, multiple roll axis 